the D&D &D rules I don't use, today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about playing the ultimate game of Dungeons and Dragons. You can level up your game by subscribing and click the bell icon for future notifications, and you'll be on your way to adventure. A few months back, I published a video called The Rules I Use, and it proved to be very popular. Thank you for watching it. So for the last few months, I've been fielding questions about, but what about this rule and that rule? So I decided to make a follow-up video. This is the rules I don't play with. Now, today I'm wearing my plus one vest of protection because I'm about to have incoming in the comments section because people are going to disagree with me. I just want to start out by saying this is entirely my opinion, and it doesn't have to be your opinion. You don't have to share it. If you don't like what I'm saying, don't use it. So the first rules I don't use are optional rules, feats and multi-classing. Here's the thing about optional rules, they're optional. You don't actually have to use them. You are perfectly within your rights as a dungeon master to say to your players, no, we're just not playing with that rule. I belong to a number of DM Facebook forums, which by the way, I really like Dungeon Craft, our forum, link to that below. One of them is for DMs only, and every so often I read about a problem DM, they're asking for help, they got a big long post, and somewhere in that post, comes up multi-classing. They are a new DM and they allowed multi-classing and now they have problems. You're gonna see responses to posts like that as well as DMs in real life walking around saying, oh, well, uh, you should never say no to the players. A good DM never says no. A good DM always knows how to roll with the punches and change the game to balance it. I just wanna start out by calling bull on that one. It clearly says in the books that feats and multi-classing is optional. That means as a DM you don't have to use them and you know what? You don't know your players an explanation. You could say nope I just don't feel like using them. Case closed. There's a reason why multi-classing and feats are optional. They greatly, I don't want to say imbalance the game, but they greatly change the balance of the game giving more power to the players. And it's very seldom, and by seldom I mean never, that it's for role-playing purposes. Like, you know, I just think my cleric had a crisis of faith, so now he wants to become a fighter. It's always like, yeah, I want a fighter who could cast Healing Word. I want to get one level in Rogue so I could do a sneak attack and then I'll become a fighter. I want to be a Barbarian until second level, then I want to switch to Druid and I'll work my way up to sixth level and then polymorph myself into a Tyrannosaurus and then Rage. By the way, that was an actual post on the website. There's nothing inherently wrong with multi-classing, but it needs to be done with an experienced dungeon master who knows how to set limits and say no to certain things. It leads to min-maxing, and there's a whole term, character building. I find that so mechanical. When I think of characters, I think of, okay, what's their motivation? Building a character is like picking the right feats and the right classes so that they can deal out the maximum damage while taking the minimum damage. Which brings us to feats. Who would ever pick actor over luck. Actor just gives you a bonus to charisma and you can fool people into thinking you're someone else. Luck can do that too. It could just make you re-roll a fail roll. Luck is far more versatile and more powerful than Actor is. Actor isn't as good as Tavern Brawler. Why would you have a charisma bonus when you could turn any candlestick or any utensil you could find into a deadly weapon? Each that raise ability scores like strength are really powerful. Yes, you could have an adventure where you have to make an intelligence test or a charisma test, but you're going to have to make 10 times as many combat tests. Every time you swing a sword, you're going to use that strength bonus. So it doesn't make any sense to choose almost anything else. See what I'm doing? See how my language shifted? I'm now no longer thinking of the character as a person, as a fictitious person with an arc and a personality. I'm, I'm thinking them in terms of them more tactically. I'm weighing my options to see how I can and max out their potential. That's what is naturally going to happen when you include tactical rules like feats. When you hear players in your game saying, oh, you know, you don't want that feat, you want this feat instead because it's going to allow you to do that, you know your game's kind of going down that road. And that's a perfectly fine road to go down if that's what you want to do. To me, it's very board gamey. It's very much like Gloomhaven. You can only do these things and you can't do things that aren't in the rules. There's a certain art to that type of game to try to figure out how to use those rules as they're written to get the most out of them. It's not the game that I or my players like to run. They never ask if they, won't, they can multi-class. They never ask about feats. They're more interested in the story aspect of the game. And that's why those rules just for us aren't necessary. Skill checks, that's an interesting one. I kind of play with skills, but I don't. Most of the time, instead of rolling dice, I just decide upon the outcome. Like, your ranger, can they track the goblins to their lair? Yes, the ranger can, especially if the next part of the adventure is called the orc lair. Is your ranger good at handling animals? Does your ranger know what berries in the woods are poisonous? Yeah, and I'm seldom going to call for a check for any of those things. If a rogue just wants to climb over a wall, am I going to make her make a roll? No. If it's a sheer 900-foot cliff face, 
that would require a role. Does your druid know how to identify poison oak? Does your archaeologist know how to identify hieroglyphics? Can your bard play a song on his lute? Those are not things that require roles. Most of the time I just decide skills and move on with the game. I often get asked, do I play with proficiency bonuses? And the clear answer is, no, kind of, sort of, yeah. When the players enter a room, I assign a difficulty for the room with this big red die. So if it's a first level orc guard room, I'll say, okay, the difficulty is 14. It's difficulty 14 to hit the orcs, hide in the shadows, search the room, search for traps, whatever. If the characters are fourth or fifth level, I'll just adjust that difficulty to a nine. This means the player characters don't have to do a lot of paperwork. I just do it for them in my head lowering the difficulty when the characters get more powerful. I also cap all the difficulties at 20. 20 is the most difficult a thing can be. Unlike in 5e, there's no such thing as a level 30 lock. To me, that's just like Spinal Tap turning the amplifiers up to 11. Why not just make 10 louder? It's just easier to adjust the 20-sided die than constantly calculate all these bonuses. This also makes prep time easier because it solves D&D scalability problem. Regardless of the character's level, they could be 36 level, but a 16 monster is a difficult encounter. The reason D&D has things like a, a, a difficulty 30 anything is because of this scalability problem. We're always comparing characters to what they were like on first level. This way, I'm only comparing the monsters in relative proportion to the player characters. So upon entering a room, the characters will always understand an 18 encounter is very tough. And by the way, thanks to Brandish Gilhelm and Index Card RPG for thinking of this because I'm not that smart. All right, now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of combat. I want to address two terms that I frequently see on message boards and in the comments section on this channel. And they are OP, overpowered, and nerfing. I find these terms vague and they mean different things to different people. To me, OP means any power or ability that allows that player to take a significantly longer turn at the table. As a player of games, I hate waiting my turn. I don't like board games that take too long to get around the whole table, and I hate it in role-playing games. So let's do multiple attacks first. I don't generally allow multiple attacks, and this is why. In straight up 5e, a 5th level fighter gets 3 attacks and up to 5 attacks with an action surge. That's 5 times as many things to do as everyone else. A wizard doesn't get 5 spells, the cleric doesn't cast healing 5 times, and this is boring because you're chucking this handful of dice and it's always like, okay, well that one missed and that one missed and, and that one might have hit, let me put that aside, and that one definitely hit, and that one, ooh, that hit. Okay, Dungeon Master, what was that armor class again? It just takes too long, especially if it's like, okay, I've got my five attacks. All right, fighter, you go next. You've got your five attacks. Oh, rogue, you get your one sneak attack. Oops, you missed. Oh, and you, fighter, you get your five attacks. While you're doing that, the other players are all doodling or looking at their cell phones or having side conversations. Before you say, oh, well, you're nerfing the fighter, not really, because in my game, instead of a dragon having 250 hit points, it only has 36. The fighter's still going to get to do the most damage. I also play with critical hits, which allows the fighter to do even more damage. So everything is reduced in proportion. There are a number of other cool things you could do with the fighter. You could say at a certain level, the fighter gets maybe permanent advantage and gets to roll twice around and take the highest number. Maybe at a certain level we can create multiple attacks by saying the fighter can split their damage between multiple targets. That at least keeps the game moving. Next, initiative. I actually did a whole video on this several months ago. It was very controversial with a lot of views and a lot of comments. Many of them are angry. I got a lot of, why are you trying to change the rules? Well, allow me to retort. In the original 1975 version of Dungeons and Dragons, there was no initiative. Everything attacks simultaneously. So back at you, Mr. Commenter. Why are you trying to change the rules? I kind of like the idea of D&D Combat being in a Quentin Tarantino, Reservoir Dogs and Glorious Bastards, everyone's firing in the basement kind of combat. I kind of like the idea where two fighters can impale each other on swords or magic users can nuke each other with fireballs. Now you may not like that idea and that's why I recommend group initiative. Just elect one of the players to roll initiative and the DM tosses the dice, they compare results and that side goes first. Taking their turns clockwise from the Dungeon Master. And I'm not nerfing the rogue or whoever you think should go first. They can just sit to the Dungeon Master's left. Before the game starts, all the players just decide who is going to sit where strategically Maybe you want that rogue to go first and you want the cleric to heal people at the end of the round. I just don't like spending five minutes trying to figure out who's going first. Uh, you go first. 
uh, then it's you. Now the monsters go, and that changes every single combat. I just can't be bothered with it. Here's another cool group initiative, because everyone likes to roll for initiative. Back in first edition, you roll a d6 for initiative. Have every one of your players just toss a six-sided die and add up the results. Then the dungeon master tosses an equal number of dice and compares the results, and that side wins the initiative. This way, everybody feels like they're involved. When I see dungeon masters with, like, a screen with, like, clips on it, like, who goes where, I'm just thinking... Oh man, this is too much. I need Excedrin just thinking about it. And finally we come to automatic spellcasting, which I believe I covered in the rules I use, but I want to do it from the reverse direction. I'm a big fan of Dungeon Crawl Classics. They require wizards like everyone else for every other skill to toss a 20-sided die to see if they succeed at casting a spell. If they roll a 1, they roll on a chart and see what terrible thing happened. I've always found it inconsistent. It's just too much cognitive dissonance for me to believe that in this world you can mess up swinging a sword. But when you're messing with the primordial forces of nature and trying to manipulate physics, nothing can go wrong. It's just completely reliable and predictable. You know, Gandalf, every time you mess with secrets that man was not meant to know, it always seems to work out just fine. 5e is about resource management, right? It's about planning what spells you might need in advance and having those in, in your slots. This version is more about risk management. You can cast Fireball every round, but eventually you're going to blow yourself up. So wizards self-regulate. They're likely to say, I'm not casting light. You can light a torch. Light's only for emergencies. And when the wizard announces they're going to cast Chain Lightning, all the players scatter because they remember what happened the last time that happened. Look, if you read any Wizards of the Coast module product, it'll say that it's designed for between four and five characters. That's the big difference between 5e and earlier versions of the game. In first edition D&D, you had six, seven, eight, nine, ten players, and a module was designed for like eight to ten characters. Now, in my game, I run for anywhere from six to ten characters. And the game, especially at higher levels, becomes slow and unwieldy. So it's not I'm trying to nerf the players, I'm trying to keep the game moving. If instead of a high-level fighter getting 10 attacks for 50 points of damage a round, they only get one attack for an average of 10 points a round, that's the same thing if dragons only have 50 hit points as opposed to 250. I'm not nerfing anything, I'm just speeding up the entire process. Yesterday we had a game where we went in the Keep on the Borderlands, we did three entire caves and about 20 different encounters, four or five more combat encounters, one was a truce, and the rest were social encounters, and we were able to do that and level up, give out the experience points, everything, in less than three hours. My players have busy lives, they're older, they're professionals, we only get to play once in a while, and to do that, certain rules just have to go, but my players keep coming back because the game is fun, and that's what role-playing games are about. Now, if you like this video, give it the thumbs up and share it on social media. Questions or comments, put it below. For more great Dungeon Craft tips, check out these videos over here. And as always, check out our Facebook group where we have conversations like this one. Once again, for Dungeon Craft, this is Professor Dungeon Master. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you at the table. May all your rolls be natural 20s.